All right. So after a, after a little bit of a of a respite, we are launching back into these little lovely Rising Tide Foundation soirees. I, I really do look forward to these, and I miss I miss not having them. So um, Quan had um, suggested that, and well, the first the first time that I ever saw this person's name, who we're about to read tonight, uh, was in the midst of work or editing Quan's brilliant three part. Uh, series. Well, it's actually a 13-part series, but we published it in three parts on the Rising Tide Foundation site, Gu Hongming, um, of Minds and Men, which is available for those listening in the description box. You don't have to read them all, but like I mentioned in my in the Substack invitation, it helps a lot to appreciate this figure who I didn't even, I never knew existed. Um, I don't know if we'll get through this all in one shot. We'll see. As is always the case, it's impossible to predict conversation, what, what we might be inspired to say, but Juan, I will give it over to you since you you're the one who's brought to light uh, this interesting figure. Um, what 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 do we need to know? What do we have? What do we have to have in mind as we as we go into this reading? Okay, so I would like to take maybe ten minutes to give a kind of introduction, not about Gu Hongming, but about what I would call the Confucian aristocratic background that need to be understood to appreciate in full the article by Professor Wang Huai Yu teaching in the United States on the last Confucian philosopher, Ku Hongming, born in 1857 and died in 1928. So uh, a small detail, uh, the contemporary transliteration system for Chinese is called Pinyin. And the G is pronounced like a K, like kangaroo. So G U is not Gu, but it's Ku Hongming. Uh, it's probably one of the way of the Chinese Communist Party to torture the Westerners. I absolutely approve 100%. That being said, uh, let's go to the Confucian background. Um, 136 BCE is the year that I would like you guys to remember. 136 BCE was the year when Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty who ruled between 141 BCE to 87 BCE, so it was the second longest reign of Chinese history. He ascended the throne in 141 BCE and he was 15 years old at the time. So Emperor Wu in 136 BCE chose Confucianism or Ru Jia, the school of the scholar, as uh, imperial ideology. From there, one, uh, 12 years later in 124 BCE, the Imperial Academy Taishue, T-A-I-X-U-E has been created. And the famous philosopher of that time, Dong Chongshu, D-O-N-G, that's his family name, Chongshu, Z-H-O-N-G, S-H-U, what is given name, and once again, the torture of the pinging. D is pronounced like a T. So D-O-N-G is pronounced Tong at the third Tong, Tong Chong Shu. Why do I take the effort to explain that in detail? Because Tong Chong Shu is a major figure in Chinese intellectual history. He was born exactly three centuries after Confucius. Confucius was born in 479 BCE and he died in 479, excuse me, he was born in 551 BCE and he died in 479 BCE. So when Dong Chong Shu was born in 179 BCE, it was exactly 300, 300 years after Confucius' burn, birth and Dong Chong Shu died in 104 BCE at 75 years old. And at the inauguration of the Taishui of the Imperial Academy, he make a little speech. I would like to read to you the first five lines of that speech, not in Chinese, but in English translation, because in those five lines, it's the perfect concentration of the Confucian endeavor. So I start the quote. Man receives his mandate from heaven and is therefore superior to all creatures. 
other creatures suffer troubles and defects and cannot practice humanity and righteousness. Man alone can practice them. All the creatures suffer troubles and defects and cannot match heaven and earth. Man alone can match them. So I stop here. That was uh, the first lines of his inaugural speech uh, at the creation of the Imperial Academy in 124 BCE, 12 years after Emperor Han of the Wu Dynasty chose Confucianism as the imperial ideology in 136 BCE. And here, I know that in a context where the word democracy is put on a pedestal, the word imperial might be a little bit uh, upsetting. But for me, imperial is not a dirty word. For me, imperial is not imperialism. Imperialism is uh, expansion, extraction, expropriation, enslavement, evangelization, and extermination. A imperialism is not imperial. Imperial is peace, order, harmony, creativity, development, and freedom. So I want to take those 30 seconds to be sure that there's no misunderstanding when I use the word imperial, because Confucianism has been the spiritual foundation or basis for the Chinese imperial endeavor since the last 2000 years and keeping on. And here, from here, I will take another five minutes to make a brief summary of what is the imperial epistemological education for the Chinese elite since 136 BCE. Because once again, Confucius was born in 551 BCE and he died in 479 BCE. And he himself received the conscious legacy of the Zhou royal house who ruled between 1046 BCE and 256 BCE. And the imperial Han house received that control legacy and transmitted that control legacy to, to the Chinese people and still in operation, if I can use that clumsy expression, in operation still nowadays. So the core of that imperial education or aristocratic education or classical education or timeless education is the following according to how I learned it when I was a child. So you have to imagine it as a simplified or schematic representation of a house. So you have a square as the foundation of the house and the triangle as the superior part of the house or the roof of the house. At the center of the square, you have an hexagram, okay? Once again, the hexagram is the simplified represent, or maybe simplify is not the right word, but the schematic or the synthetic representation of the epistemological development on six stages or six layers of the mind. The first layer being the sense of perception, the second layer being the intellect, wording, conceptualizing, imaging, the third layer being uh, social sophistication, you have a space representing the science, the arts, and philosophy, and going to the fourth layer representing beauty, the fifth layer, goodness, and the last layer, wisdom. So imagine uh, an hexagram. I like the hexagram number 11 because it's that the hexagram number 11 means supreme peace. And that hexagram is made by three plain lines as lines one, two, three, and three broken lines as lines four, five, six. So it can be any of the 64 hexagram, but I like hexagram 11. So I put that hexagram 11 at the center of the square symbolizing the Chinese classical epistemological journey. At the four corner of the square, you have what is called the four books or su shu in Chinese. The four books are the analects. And once again, analects is the English word coming from the Greek word 
analecton, meaning selected sayings. So the analects are the selected, selected sayings of Confucius. The other corner is the Mencius, meaning the book by the philosopher Carl Mencius, who was born in 389, in 372 BCE and who died in 289 BCE. The third corner is the Tasre, meaning the great learning by Confucius direct disciple, Master Zhang. And the fourth layer is Chongyong, centrality. And that was written by Confucius' grandson, Zhu Si. All those four books are about the epistemological development, meaning the journey through the sex layers of the mind. So that is the foundation of the house. Now we go to the roof of the house and that foundation of the house has been created by the Confucian school after Confucius. Why I say that? Because once again, the name of the Confucianism in Chinese is Ru Jia, meaning the school of the scholars. And that school of the scholar existed before Confucius. It existed for about a thousand years before Confucius, and that was the school for the children of the aristocrats and the children of the school. So it is not a surprise that that school created the aristocratic, the classical or the timeless education. So those four books have been put in definitive form after Confucius. So as I said, Confucius received the control legacy of the Chow Royal House and the Imperial House of the Han received that legacy from, the Confu from Confucius and his disciples. And from there, it went to the many generation after them till us. Mm -hmm. That is for the foundation of the epistemological journey but I was speaking of the control legacy of the Chow Royal House, or rather, to be precise, the Chi Royal House, because Chi, J-I, was their family name, and Chow, Z-H-O-U, was the name of their dynasty. So I should say the Chi Royal House, or the Chow Dynasty, having room once again between 1046 BC to 770 BC as truly king but they lost the power in 770 BCE, but they did not disappear till 256 BCE. And du during those five centuries where they lost their true political and military power, they still retain a control shine. So they influenced the culture of the Chinese people during those last five centuries. So it was a very long decline, but it was a fruitful decline because they still kept on playing the role of cultural leaders and of religious leaders. So the roof of the house, uh, uh, the triangle above the, the square, at the center of the triangle, imagine the word I Ching, okay, the classic of the change. Because uh, I was speaking of the four book, the Su Shu, but the triangle is about the Wu Qing, the five classic. And at the center of the five classic is the I Ching, the book of change. I will not talk about that, but I will talk about that later maybe. On the left corner, you have the Shu Ching, meaning the books of song, comprising 305 poems, uh, which were poems from the people of the different principalities. I think it was 160 poems on the 305 who were from the people. And the rest, the 305 minus 160, were poems from the Chow Royal Court or the Royal Court or the aristocratic courts of the different principalities. On the right side of the base of the triangle, you have the Su Qing, the books of documents, and it's about uh, the different documents uh, as old as 1100 BCE to around 600 BCE related to the Chow Royal House. And at the top the vertex of the triangle, we have the last two uh, classics. The classics on rituals, but in reality, the classic of on rituals is made by three classics or three books, if you want, uh, put together 
to be the classic on ritual. It was about the Chow Li, the classic of the Chow dynasty, the Li Yi, etiquette and ceremonies, and Li Qi, records and ceremony. And finally, at the top, the Chun Chu. The Chun Chu, the basic document of the Chun Chu is uh, the historical chronicle of the Lu principality, the principality from which Confucius came between the year 722 and 482. Why does the Chun Chu stop at 482 BCE? It's not because uh, the archivists stop their records in 482 BCE, but it was simply because Confucius died in 479 BCE and he stopped his uh, philosophical elaboration and expansion on that basic chronicles. That's why it stopped in 482, because the philosophical expansion stopped there. Why I'm speaking of a philosophical expansion? It is because the Chun Chus has the three philosophical interpretation. One is called the Ku Liang, and why Ku Liang? Well, it was simply the name of the guy who wrote that philosophical expansion, G-U-L-I-A-N-G. And in the Ku Liang, it is more an expansion on rituals. And here, rituals, you have to understand that it's not the robotic imitation of something that you learn. Rituals is the spontaneous and inner a rather outer manifestation from what your heart, your soul, and your mind truly understood. Because sadly, when most people hear the word rituals, they will make the association with robotic behavior or stupid imitation. Here, rituals has to be understood as your exterior behavior when you truly understood the principles in your mind, your heart, and your soul. is called the Zuo Chuan, the transmission or the tradition from Mr. Zuo. And Zuo is written Z-U-O, and Chuan is Z-H-U-A-N. So transmission by Mr. Zuo, like the Ku Liang, it's Ku Liang Chuan, transmission or tradition by Mr. Ku Liang. And the transmission by Mr. Zuo, Z-U-O, is more something about real politics, about international relations, about geopolitics, about intrigue at courts, about military maneuvers, about the diplomatic skills. And in that narrative history of China of that period, 722 to 482 BCE, so about 250 years, you will all have all kind of story about diplomatic skills, about international relations, about geopolitical maneuvers, etc. And last but not least, the Kong Yang Chuang, the tradition or the transmission by Mr. Kong Yang, written G O N G Y A N G, and that transmission or tradition by Mr. Kong Yang is about universal history, meaning that it is the epistemological journey as live personally, but translated collectively as a human relation, not defined as my is right, but rather my serving right or my serving justice. And once again, the epistemological development is to reach to the development of the four ultimate powers of the mind. And those four ultimate powers of the mind in the timeless reality is called beauty, goodness, and truth, or using Chinese words, yi ran tao. Yi is for justice, but yi is the Chinese word for beauty, but the Chinese word, don't use the word mei, which is the Chinese word for beauty, for beauty, but would use yi, which is justice, meaning the highest form of beauty, for the timeless form of beauty. So beauty in time is the power of the mind capable to see what is justice in a specific situation. 
and to be capable to act in a practical manner to uphold justice in that specific situation. The second timeless form, uh, goodness, a run in Chinese, is translated in time as valor of, and humanity. Humanity can also be said as moderation or temperance. Valor here is not only physical prowess, but valor here is also valor in the sense of exploration of our inner universe, the epistemological development, or exploration of the outer universe, exploration of nature, meaning art, science, and technology, etc. And finally, the last timeless form, truth, translated in time, is the fourth power of the mind, of the fully developed mind, wisdom. So once again, the Chinese or any classical education, but here I'm speaking of the Chinese one, the Chinese classical education is for the development of the four ultimate powers of the mind called in the timeless reality, beauty, goodness, and truth, irantao, or in the time dimension, justice, valor, moderation, and wisdom. Why I took the time to give the background is so Ku Hongming, even if he was born in 1857 and he died in 1928, was a pure product of that imperial education having been sanctioned by Emperor Wu in 136 BCE and having started the Imperial Academy in 124 BCE and still keeping on nowadays with the Chinese Communist Party or uh, I prefer to say the Chinese Civilization Party. I stop here my speech. That was that was great. Thank you. And and quick question regarding um, what you just laid out. We recently had a class about a month and a half ago um, where somebody introduced the Guanzhou. Um, and I was curious if that also plays into the configuration you just laid out, like in the, the, the ritual section or or is that not really playing directly into the composition? Uh, it's not in the four books and the, in the five classic, but Quan Zhu was from Quan Chong, who was the minister of a, look, of a Duke of Qi, living in the 7th century BCE. And he was uh, writing about uh, how to rule a state and about economic uh, principles. And uh, uh, that guy lived in the 7th century BCE. Let's not forget that the Imperial Academy has been created in 124 BCE. So he, uh, his work has not been integrated to the four books and the five classics, but it's part of the Confucianist books that have been used by the Imperial Academy and has been acknowledged if, even if the Quan Zhu, and Quan Zhu mean Master Quan, okay? Most of the time uh, in the ancient time, the book is simply the name of the author. Mm. Uh, so that Quan Zhu was consider part of the Confucian, let's say, literature, even if we can argue that he can be a kind of legalist uh, literature too, because once again, that guy was the prime minister of Duke Huan of Qi, living two centuries before Confucius. But uh, even if he's not, his book is not in the four books and the five classics, is acknowledged as someone having contributed to the classical Chinese uh, education. Okay, great. So um, can I, that... uh, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt here. I'm, I'm taking notes as we go here and you know, I'll write as fast as I can, but I miss things quickly. You mentioned the six levels of the epistemological journey. Could you just list them again? Yes, sir. And please, uh, uh, I have the, um, uh, please see them as the following, okay? Uh, oops, yep. uh, no, you need, like you need to bring, yeah, to your okay. left. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hexagram. Okay, so you see the hexagram. So imagine them as the hexagram and the uh, the Chinese character just beside is pronounced Wang, W-A-N-G, and it means king or sovereign in Chinese, okay? So the first line of the hexagram is census perception. Uh, it's the same than for Plato, eh? by the way. Yeah, that, the that's second, why I wanted to list them, yeah. 
uh, and, the, and the second is the intellect. The intellect is for wording, conceptualizing, imaging. The third line is for social sophistication. That is the line of the surface. The space between the third line and the and the fourth line is the space of the gardens of the nine muses, okay? For the Chinese, we don't say the garden of the nine muses because it's a Greek stuff, but, but the Chinese have the equivalent and it is called the six liberal arts, Liu Yi in Chinese, okay? So the space, the space between the third line and the fourth line for the Chinese is the six liberal arts, Liu Yi. The fourth line, is uh, E, which is justice, but it, it is the name for the Chinese for beauty, okay? And the, the fifth line, the line of the aristocratic man, since we are speaking of the aristocratic or classical education, timeless education, is goodness corresponding in time to valor and moderation humanity or temperance are synonym synonymous for moderation. I prefer moderation, it's only personal. And the sixth line, the timeless form of truth corresponding in time to the power of the mind called wisdom. And the Chinese character that I want to show again, Wang, Rather than to have six lines, it has four lines, three horizontal lines and one vertical line. The, 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 the bottom horizontal lines correspond to what line one and two of the hexagram. For the Chinese, it is earth. The second horizontal lines of the character King Wang correspond to the hexagram lines number three and number four. And the top horizontal lines of the character one correspond to the hexagram lines number five and six. And the vertical line is the hierarchy of awareness that would accompany the development of the powers of the mind, okay? So the king is the person uniting heaven, the top line, horizontal line, man, the middle horizontal line, and earth, the bottom horizontal line. And the king is not necessarily the ruler of a kingdom, of an empire, of, of a state. The king is the fully developed man, okay? The aristocratic man. And just for fun, the Chinese have a stuff that is called a kaiwan to, for making tea and drinking tea. The saucer correspond to the bottom horizontal line for king. The cup itself corresponds to man, and there is a cover that corresponds to heaven. And why the cup is empty? The cup normally is empty, right? Why is the cup correspond to man? Because man has to be empty in order to receive the teaching from heaven. But for receiving that teaching for heaven, he has as foundation the base. Because if you don't have uh, the body, the sense perception and the intellect, you're not capable to go to social sophistication, to beauty, to goodness, and to truth. Very, very poetic. Yeah, you know, th this is good. I'm, I'm looking forward to this little, this little introduction and um, we're so immersed with uh, Hobbesian Western Enlightenment theories about geopolitics and ethics, that uh, it's good to just sort of shake that off and really immerse oneself a little bit into some of the the core thinking and the spirit of a people that have that have thrived for thousands of years. So this is going to be good. And like I said, uh, Quan, after we finish this, will you have any links to good translations of uh, uh, Wu Hong Ming himself? because I know this is a, an introduction to him, but do, are, yeah. are there going to be any good uh, texts that are in English? Uh, I would have to look for, because I don't know any English translation. I read it in Chinese uh, when I was young, 
Uh, that's why I was so happy when I found that text by uh, the Sino-American professor Wang Hua Yu, because, uh, well, if I, I found some good English or French translation, even German, if I find one, found some, uh, if I'm capable to find some, I wouldn't uh, contact you. But uh, sadly, the only text I know are in Chinese. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll be satisfied for this for now. All right. So let me, let me hit a screen share. Can everyone see that screen? I presume the answer is yes. Oh, no, lost it. Okay, so people see a Word document open? I presume, Matt, that the link to the document that's at the top of the uh, article there will be available for us to download. Oh, yeah, most certainly. It's it's yeah. in the uh, it's in the, the Substack invitation to today's reading. You'll find it yeah, there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, good. Thanks. All right, so... Hold on, uh, Press TV is just writing to me. Oh, stop. Hold on, I'm so sorry. Skype is going out of control right now. One moment. Okay. So, um... I can I can read today. I never read. I'm gonna read. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, like I said, like usual, um, everyone is free to jump in whatever they like. If they want to stop, ask a question, uh, please do. Come on, it's press TV. Uh, what is the subject? Okay. Gu Hongming, no, sorry, the lost Confucian philosopher, Gu Hongming, and the Chinese religion of good citizenship. Matt, I'm sorry to be a pain in the butt, but it's cool like kangaroo. Oh, cool. Okay, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of these types of mistakes that I'm going to make in the next, I'm going to slaughter my, my pinyin uh, reading for, for the next little bit here. Uh, well, I'm just going to have to turn down an offer to speak. Uh, so Presti is asking, uh, the topic tonight at 10 p.m. is Russia says it is extremely hard to believe that Daesh terrorist group would have had the capacity to launch the deadly shooting. Um, I could speak about that. So the, the lost Confucian philosopher, Ku Hongming, and the Chinese religion of good citizenship by Huai Yu Wang. Is that right? Uh, does, um, don't, don't correct me, actually. Uh, from the Department of Philosophy and Religion and Liberal Studies. Okay. Gu Hongming was a, uh, sorry, Ku Hongming was a Chinese scholar official in the late Qing dynasty, who received comprehensive European education in his early years. He was widely recognized as one of China's most distinguished Confucian philosophers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For a long period after Ku's death, Ku had been largely forgotten both in China and abroad, except for travesties of his conservative streaks. The new generations of Confucians... How do, how do I pronounce that? Xin Rui Ruhia? Xin Ru Chia. But Xin I would say, uh, uh, just pronounce spontaneously, I was a pain in the neck for the name of Ku Hongming because, after all, he, ha he is the philosopher that we want to study. Yeah. So, at least for him, but for the rest, I think it's not so important. But anyway, it's Xin Ru Chia. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. So from this point forward, I'm going on mostly instinct um, and less intellect. <laughs> but, all right. The new generations of Confucians had never mentioned Ku in their scholarly works. While there have been rising interests in Ku and his, uh, and his works recently, most publicly and scholarly attentions have centered upon certain eccentric aspects of his penchants and personality. There have been few discussions about the philosophical value and relevance of his ideas. Thus, who remains a lost Confucian philosopher? The purpose of this essay is to introduce Ku's philosophy with a focus on his thesis of 
the Chinese religion of good citizenship. Gu lived in a historical period when China and many other countries were subjugated by modern Western powers under the prevalent beliefs in Enlightenment universalism and the signifier civilization of the West. As Prasenjit Duara relates, this singular conception of civilization based largely upon Christian and Enlightenment values came only not only to be dominant, but to be the only criterion whereby so sovereignty could be claimed in the world. Coupled with social Darwinism, it had served as pretexts for various practices of racism, colonialism, and imperialism as Western imperial nations invoked the signifier to justify their conquest as, civil as a civilizing mission. The economic and political expansion of modern Western civilization came about also with a moral crisis featured by unremitting clashes of utilitarian and reformative values with conventional social ideals and structures. Drawing upon classical Confucian teachings and the aesthetic ideals of modern Romantic thinkers, Gu proposed that the ultimate solution to major problems of modernity, such as de decaying social and international solidarity, destructive materialism and commercialism, and abuse of racial and nationalistic prejudices must be a moral and cultural solution. In essence, Gu holds that truth, understood in the, its deepest and broadest sense as the sense of honor and truthfulness in one's engagement with persons and things, is of universal and eternal appeal for all humankind. As a living tradition, the value of traditional Confucian social order consists in its continuous personification of the law of the gentleman that inspires ordinary persons to realize this sense of honor and truthfulness by fulfilling their respective roles and responsibilities. The Confucian ideal of civilization is not infinite happiness or self-indulgence for everybody, but the complete and perfect realization of true moral being, the sense of obligation, the moral order in mankind, so that the universe shall become a cosmos and all things can attain their full growth and development. Uh, can I interrupt here? Sure. Okay, what... Uh... First, uh, uh, Gu Hongming spoke and wrote English, okay? So the translation, the religion of good citizenship is not by Professor Wang Huai Yu, but by Gu himself. The translation as the religion of the good citizen or the religion of good citizenship is Gu uh, creativity expressed in that way. The Chinese words are Chun Tzu Chu Tao. Chun Tzu Chu Tao, words by words, are, is the way of the gentleman. Okay? Chun Tzu, word by word, Chun means lord and Tzu means son. Chun Tzu means the son of a lord. So during Confucius time, even before and after, a Chun Tzu was the word for a born aristocrat, a nobleman. And from Confucius time, Chun Tzu still meant a born aristocrat, but also a high-minded person because he went on the epistemological journey, especially if he reached to the awareness level of the aristocratic man, if we look at the hexagram, it is the fifth line, okay? First, I want to say I gave uh, the layers of the mind development as a sense perception, intellect, social sophistication, beauty, goodness, and truth. But let's not forget that politically, it corresponds to types of man. Sense of perception correspond to the democratic man. The democratic man is the man motivated by sense perception, by hedonism, by lex talionis, meaning by revenge, and by tribal affinities, okay? And the second line is the plutocratic man, okay? That plutocratic man, his intellect, his mental capacity is the intellect, but politically he's motivated by wealth power for 
wealth and power by themselves and not, and not as tools for higher purposes. The third line, politically, is the surface or the fake democratic map. Having the mind power of the sense perception, of the intellect, and of the social sophistication, right? So when I was speaking of sense perception, intellect, or social sophistication, I'm speaking of mind powers. But those mind powers wouldn't correspond to types of political man. And the sophist is the fake democratic man, meaning the man that would try to make injustice appear as justice, okay, by using narratives, by using mythology, etc. Okay, so it's very important to understand that those mind layers at the personal level will translate to, to the kind of political person that you are. And if in a given society, you have mostly democratic man and uh, plutocratic man, in reality, even if you have beautiful speeches pretending that you are democracy or the republic, the reality is not a real, well, I don't like the word democracy, I just push it away, because for me, it's the democratic man, meaning a lowly man. So you can pretend that you have a republic, but you don't really have a republic if you don't have the aristocratic man that are needed to create a true republic. And I want to keep on with the timeless form of beauty corresponding to the mind power of justice. And there you have the true democratic man, T-I-M-O-C-R-A-T-I-C, meaning the man having the mind powers to create a republic. After that, you have the capacity for valor and for humanity corresponding politically to the aristocratic man, okay? And the Chinese expression that has been translated as the religion of good citizenship is Junzi Chu Tao. Junzi is a Chinese word for gentleman. Okay, so I said that Jun is Lord and Zi is the son, son of a lord. The son of a lord is a gentleman. In the past, it meant a born aristocrat, but from Confucius time, it meant a born aristocrat, and it also meant a person having achieved his epistemological development to the fifth line, to the level of the mind powers of moderation and valor. Okay, so and in this text, also it also it essentially means the mind development and not being a born aristocrat, and. The sixth line, of course, is the line of wisdom, the mind powers of wisdom corresponding to politically speaking to the philosopher king. But once again, the transition from the aristocratic man and the philosopher king is another pair of speech that is not included in this text. Why I want to talk about that? Because don't make no mistake, okay? The English translation is very weak, the religion of the good citizenship. When you hear that, uh, it doesn't mean Chun Tzu Chu Tao, okay? Chun Tzu Chu Tao, it's much more powerful. It means the way of the gentleman in the platonic meaning. And that's why I interrupted Matt because I want that people understand that very clearly. It is the way of the powers of the mind of justice, valor, and moderation, okay? That is what you have to understand. And that is why it is important that I interrupted Matt. I'm sorry. Mm. No, that was very, very welcomed. That was a, that was a pleasant interruption. Good. Uh, I got a, a yep. I guess it's a question. Um, you're met, we're talking about like one, two, and three, uh, democratic, your plutonic, the plutonic, a oh, plutocratic oh, plut man. Plutocratic, they, yeah. Democratic, okay. Uh, fake democratic, fake, fake democratic. Yeah. And so that's like the common, it's almost like most people are like that today. Would I don't want to that? be, I don't want to be impolite, but I, I, I want to be impolite. Most people in the West, in my mind, are democratic man and plutocratic okay. man. All right. So 
And I, so and, let, let, let's be fair. Most people in China too are democratic and plutocratic man, but they are not allowed to have political power. And there's the rub right there. Um, so, yes. okay, we got those three. And in order to, to advance, we got this um, this space. Like it's a space between three, one, two, three, and four, five, and six. The uh, And I'm kind of intrigued on that. That's where all, all the... Uh, the muses, um, the liberal arts. And yes. So, so we, we as people, we gotta, we have to learn all that, or at least some of that, to, to even get to four, five, and six, right? I am very happy about your question, Kelly. Exactly. And In so China, that, that's a key yeah. thing, and that's a key problem. If that's if we have a problem in the world, that's the key problem. In the sense that. China is perceived in the West as authoritarian. I, I understand from the democratic man in the West perspective that China is perceived as authoritarian because in China, there is a long imperial tradition starting in 124 BCE with the creation of the Imperial Academy that a lowly man cannot have political power. Lowly man for me are the democratic man, the plutocratic man and the fake democratic man. Only the man at four, five, and six, democratic man, aristocratic man, and philosopher kings can have political power. And when I said at first that for me, most people in the West are democratic man and plutocratic man, I corrected myself 10 seconds later by saying that I want to be fair. In China- I understand in, what you mean though. Yeah, in China, in Asia, most people are also democratic man and women and plutocratic men and women. But the difference between the West and China, it is that because of the Chinese Confucianist tradition and the Chinese imperial tradition, the lowly men and women are not allowed to have political power. How true is that of China today, Kwan? Is there, uh, you know, at a local level, for example, my understanding is that the the spread of political power or the opportunity to actually get things done within a, within a community at a, uh, I don't want somewhere a smaller level, if you like, a, a local level is actually pretty good. I, I, I am I'm thankful to you, Paul, to have brought that nuance. Exact. At the level of the cities, of the townships and that kind of stuff, uh, the basic people, the democratic man, the plutocratic man and the sophists are allowed to have local forms of power, absolutely. But they yeah, are not so allowed to have powers at the national level in terms yeah. of development of education, of science, technology, and art of, of national defense. I'm grateful to, to you, Paul, for having brought that nuance. I, I've seen a lot of articles, you know, I've looked for them actually, or gone, you know, searching over various things that, that, that do paint a very different picture of the way the West perceives political power in China and the reality yeah. in China, which just the, the comment that I made is based on that. Yes, and I would like to introduce a technical word. In, in, uh, in true Western political philosophy, there's a concept called subsidiarity. S-U-B-S-I-D-I-A-R-Y. Subsidiarity or subsidiarity principle, meaning that it is possible to give some small pieces of power to the local level. So it is not excluded that, I'm sorry for my uh, pretentious uh, vocabulary. It is not uh, excluded to give to the lowly people some power, but not the highest form of power. Yeah, local control, not national control. Or uh, important subject because mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the local level, you also have education, police, uh, uh, national defense at that at the local level when it's about important subject like education justice uh, police national defense uh, it is only the democrats and the aristocrats who have power mm -hmm. yeah that, that's definitely um something we in the west have have neglected whenever we have attained a, a true humanist quality of, of education and, and and cultural uh learning teaching we have failed so deeply to ever defend it as an institution. 
Uh, so we haven't we've allowed too easily a lot of our and you could see it by the, the the way we build our schools. A lot of these are very concrete buildings, not a lot of I mean, there, there's just this very um, th this lacking of the sacred in our sense of what is education, its purpose and what is the, the caliber of the thoughts that we we will protect and and cultivate for the next generation such that we've allowed these things to become contaminated by sophists so much more uh, repeatedly uh, compared to what we've seen from China's ability to maintain continuity um, of these types of structures. It's it's a, extremely important to be able to do this. So, well, yeah. you don't need you don't need me, Matt, to, to know that the difference. Uh, what is what happened in the West? Let's say in the in the last uh, let's say 60, 70 years is that the plutocratic man and the sophist managed somehow uh, to take the hem. Yeah. And if we want to be very pessimistic, maybe in the last 150 years, but I don't want to be too uh, uh, of, uh, uh, as, uh, of an exaggeration. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a whole conversation there. Yes. Um, Christopher notes institu institutions without culture. Yes, no. I mean, at the same time, to when you actually dig scratch the surface, these institutions, the culture animating these institutions, unfortunately, is uh, smells like sulfur. <laughs> um, but that's a whole again other thing. So here, let's get back on the reading, and uh, I'm sure we'll get at least halfway through this. Um, remarkably, so yeah, I, I love. It. I'll just reread that again because I, I enjoyed this so much. The Confucian ideal of civilization is not infinite happiness or self indulgence for everybody but the complete and perfect realization of true moral being, the sense of obligation and moral order in mankind so that the universe shall become a cosmos and all things can attain their full growth and development. Remarkably, many scholars today, including leading Confucian scholars like Henry Rosemont, have regarded it necessary to stay away from the ideas of truth, universal and absolute altogether in order to remedy the hegemonic dimensions of West, modern Western colonialism and imperialism and Enlightenment universalism. In light of Ku's insights, however, the true crisis of modernity is not what Rosemont has pinned down as the belief in the one true morality that has to be established with the greatest number of machine guns. As everyone with basic moral sense can see, to advocate the one true morality with machine guns would have implicated a fundamental inconsistency with the basic principles of this morality already, such as Kant's notion of autonomous self, who must treat humanity in oneself and others as an end in itself. In all appearances, what is accountable for the modern crisis of morality is not the utter falsity or irrelevance of the one true morality. It was rather the lack of genuine belief in humanity, which brings about an atmosphere of hypocrisy throughout. Uh, it is what Ku had described as the moral bankruptcy of the capitalist political economic system. Uh, may I interrupt again? Of course. What is a hypocrite? Someone who says one thing and does another. Okay, that's that's perfectly right. But uh, uh, the hypocrite, with, the hypocrite first is the sophist, right? Mm. Because if we go back to the first three lines, the democratic man is someone so obsessed with uh, sense perception at, of enjoying this pleasure and the pain of the senses uh, that he doesn't have the capacity to be a hypocrite. The plutocratic man, which the archetype is Trasimachus in the Republic, who said very bluntly that justice is the will of the powerful or the advantage of the powerful. I don't remember the exact word. I think it was the, the advantage of the powerful. The plutocratic man is not a hypocrite. So both the democratic man and the plutocratic man, they have at least that quality of being candid. Hypocrisy begins with the fake democratic man or the sophist. What is the quality that he has compared to the others? Because it's a quality that makes him capable of hypocrisy. Mm. A lack of love of truth? 
Yes, but uh, uh, the democratic man is also lacking of a love of truth and the plutocratic man is also lacking of a love of truth. It's not that that makes a difference between them. There's something that the sophist has positively, but not enough to make the difference between him and the other two just under him. Because the plutocratic man most of the time are more, is more powerful than the sophist. But the sophist is capable to manipulate him because of that quality precisely. He, he knows certain things. Yes. He, higher things that the other two don't have. Absolutely. He knows certain things incompletely. Okay. Because once again, I would like to show it again. The, the Chinese character Wang is made by three horizontal lines connected by a vertical lines corresponding to the six lines of the hexagram. And both Wang and the hexagram are synthetic representation of the epistemological journey. Episteme in Greek, epistemological, of course, comes from episteme. Episteme most of the time is translated by knowledge, but episteme is infinite awareness, okay? It's between the dance between the finite and the infinite. The surface is at the line where he has enough awareness, so he is capable to show a beautiful face. Because when I say, who, who, what is a hypocrite and who is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who is aware enough to show a beautiful face, but he's not that in reality with it. But what is different between him and the other two who are under him, the democratic man and the plutocratic man, is that the democratic man and the plutocratic man, they don't even have enough awareness to know that there are some answers that are considered as beautiful answers, and there are some answers that are considered as lower or not beautiful or ugly answers. So what the sophist or the fake democratic man has more than the democratic man and the plutocratic man is that he attained that level of awareness that is called in Greek metis, M-E-T-I-S, and metis is the intelligence of being cunning because he has that drop of awareness that is enough for him to know what is the beautiful face to show to others, even if he is not that in reality inside. And that is precisely the journey of the space between line three and line four that will make you truly inside what is the beautiful image that the sophists want to show to others. And that is the difference between the fake democratic man the surface, like three, the journey of the classical education of the nine muses, according to the Greeks, or of the six liberal arts, according to the Chinese, going to the top first line, the fourth line of the true democratic man, okay? It's not for nothing that the surface is called the fake democratic man, and the fourth line is called the true democratic man or simply the democratic man because at the line of the surface, he is aware enough to show the beautiful face even if inside he's not that. But when a man or woman journey on the epistemological journey, meaning the journey of awareness to the, fifth line, the fourth line, that man, that woman, shows a beautiful face, but it is also what he or she is within because he or she has the power of the mind called justice to embody that reality. Ken, you have a question? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, so to Quan. So to, for whose benefit does the sophist perform? See, this, this whole question of this good face that he's able to, uh, you know, uh, impersonate himself with suggests that even on the lower levels, there's an awareness not of what good is, but that there is good. In other words, there has to be some preconception 
that what the sophist is emulating actually exists. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely, because the sophist is perfectly capable to understand the, the dialogue of Plato, okay? I'm absolutely sure that I, if I speak with a true sophist, I would be absolutely amazed by his understanding of the 40 dialogues or 40 or so dialogues of, by Plato or any classical work, because let's not forget that the second line is the intellect, right? The third line is social sophistication, but it also means that he, his intellect is perfect, is absolutely awesome. So he mastered the words, the concept, the images. So he understand at that level that it is possible to show a beautiful face for whom you said, for himself and for his masters, the plutocrats, because most of the time, what the sophist will bring is his capacity for narrative, for storytelling, for mythology, for yes. planning, for planning. Right. And his master, the plutocrats, are not as capable as him intellectually, but they have the hard power, the money, the weapons, right, right. and so on. But who, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, uh, who, who, who is he... Uh, who is his effort to influence? Okay, isn't it? Isn't it? I, those, I can answer that maybe. Well, okay, uh, okay. Um, let's let's hear Kelly's answer. Isn't the sophist? Um, it's the person that pays him. That's who he. Yeah, uh, yeah of course. Like he works. Yeah. He, he, that's that's what he does. He he does this for a profit. Yes. Yes. And that's it. Let's yeah, not forget. Again, okay, go he, ahead. So his masters are the ones that pay him. Uh, that's one reason for sure. But Ken, what did you want to say? Yeah. Uh, so um, but the question is not who's 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 uh, on whose behalf is he influencing, but whom is he influencing? In other words, or below him. Yes, I'm yes. trying to get at this point that below him there is apparently some awareness that there is something better than. Uh, uh, you know, something that we will call the beautiful or the good. And therefore, he has to impersonate that in order to influence those below. But that, but that uh, apprehension that there is such a thing pre-exists his, his effort to influence it, is all I'm saying, even on the lower levels. That's, that's yes. what's in, interesting to me. But I want to go back to Plato once again, okay? In Plato, allegory of the cave, the sophist is the man having been capable to liberate himself from the shackles. Right. And from right. there, he has two paths that are offered to him. Either he keep on his epistemological journey to the entrance of the cave, or he climbs up the platform, joining the plutocrats playing with the puppets. Do you remember that in book seven right, right. of the Republic? Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's why the sophists or the fake democratic man are the animals of preference of the philosopher king and of the aristocratic man, because he is better than the democratic man and he's better than the plutocratic man from a mental perspective. When you catch the fake democratic man at his crossroads, okay, his crossroads is when he has to choose between going, keeping on his epistemological to the entrance of the cavern, of the, of the cave, I'm sorry, or to climb up the platform to join the plutocrats to play the, with the puppets in order to manipulate the democratic man and the other lower plutocratic man, right? So that's why I have always been interested by the sophists because they are at a crossroads. And one of the endeavors of the aristocratic man is to catch the sophist when he's at the crossroads. So to bring him to the exit and not climbing to the platform to join the plutocrats. Yeah, right. That that art form of catching one before they make the exit, I guess that that sort of gives, a, gives us an idea of the sort of thing that's been built up or baked into the Rhodes Scholarship system or, or a lot of the types of experiencing uh, experiences that uh, uh, somebody who is tapped for the skull and bones or from a, for a high-level uh, experience within Cambridge is going to go through is 
and it's quite something, right? To to it, it's quite the risk in a sense. So it has to be very calculated to be able to bring somebody to that that threshold and then <laughs> take them back into the the chamber where they they're going to be a puppet master. It's devilishly interesting. Well, the oligarchy are not made by dumb people. Okay, no. contrary to the speech that say that they are dumb. I'm sorry, they are not dumb. In the animal kingdom, they are the highest people. Let's not be naive. Yeah. In the animal kingdom, yes. And I guess without going off too much more, but I, but I I feel impelled to just add to this as well. Once once out of the the cave, there's there's often this thing that I I it really struck me when I. I, I read the Republic the first time and I kind of missed it. And then I read it the second time and it made it, it jumped out at me, which which is the, the qualification of the true philosopher to then be willing and even feel impelled uh, to go back into the cave, which when you read a lot of the the Neoplatonists of, uh, of the John Ruskin type, they're happy just getting out of the cave or what they think of as being out of the cave. And they ignore that troublesome part, which compels them to do a to do something more and even like risk being discomfortable or die by going back into the cave to helping others. And they despise that part. They just, w they would rather that Plato had never said that. And they pretend that he didn't because <laughs> uh, it overthrows the whole Straussian calculus <laughs> completely. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to go back to the image of the six liberal arts or the, the gardens of the muses. Uh, I call it in a caricatural manner, 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 35 to 3.9, okay, universal history, as long, 3.10, I'm sorry, as long as you're not in 3.10, which is exactly equal to four, the real democratic man, you can fall at any moment, even at 3.8. So uh, uh, building the true everlasting civilization, having a true core of aristocratic man through the centuries is truly a titanic, a Herculean, a Promethean endeavor. And it's the core of, uh, I want to make a little bit of boasting for China, the core of the reality of Chinese civilization. Chinese civilization for complex reasons has always been capable to maintain that core of aristocratic man, capable to recreate the Chinese empire after each fall, till now. Till year 4722, I don't want to be too boastful because history is not finished. So I don't want to provoke destiny, but uh, till <laughs> now, Chinese civilization has always been capable to keep that core of aristocratic man, which is the root of the rebirth of the Chinese empire after each fall. Mm. Good. All right. It is here. Let me just go back. So the, I've noticed that there are some footnotes. It's not so easy to read them, though. Um, does anybody have a copy? Quan, do you do you recommend skipping the footnotes, or should we find a way to read the footnotes as they come up? Oh, you're on. You're on mute, Quan. Yeah, I suggest to read the footnote because they are interesting. Okay. Uh, they they are at the end. I think that I I, I use the uh, copy that you sent me, uh, everyone. Uh, are they at the end or are they in smaller characters? No, they're at the end. Yeah, uh, they're at the end. Unfortunately, maybe we we should name someone to read the footnotes because you wouldn't have to move. Uh... Okay, so if, if somebody could go and download this document from the Substack invitation that I had just sent out, and then go down on your document to the end, and uh, Matthew, then... Matthew, yes, I Paul. would do that. I would volunteer to do this exactly. But having just looked a few minutes ago, there is no link. I can't find a link to the document on the uh, email that I received. Oh, no. Are you serious? Do other people have the same problem? Uh... Uh, I have one link, and that link gave uh, the, the main text. And at the end of the main text, we have a kind of uh, reference. Yeah, it says download the essay here. So in the invitation of the Substack uh, that I sent out to today's reading, there's a. it says... Download the essay here. If you click on that. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking for a, for a, a link. Download the essay here. All right. Save. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Okay. I've downloaded it. So in that sense, 
just a minute. I got to move it into my. Well, you move it. I'll just reread that again. In all appearances, what is accountable for the modern crisis of morality is not the utter falsity or irrelevancy of the one true morality. It was rather the lack of genuine belief in humanity, which brings about an atmosphere of hypocrisy throughout. It is what Gu ha Ku had described as the moral bankruptcy of the capitalist political economic system. I'll just keep reading to the end of that paragraph and then read and then you could read footnote one. Indeed, when neither the social and political leaders nor the masses take any truth or moral principles of right and wrong as an absolute with binding power under all circumstances, the one true morality can be easily manipulated by individuals or nations to sanction their selfish interests with legitimate violence and dominance. Footnote one, please. I'm trying to find it, mate. <laughs> I've only just managed to open it. Hang on, footnote one. Footnote one, C. Gu, Ruskin's criticism of modern political political economy that had great influences on both. I'm sorry, my Chinese pronunciations will be terrible. Zhu and Gandhi's ideas. Oh, that's interesting. That's Ruskin. Is that the same yeah. Ruskin I'm thinking of? No. That's not John Which Ruskin. Was... Hard to believe. Yes. But once again, <laughs> once again, I want to reintroduce some nuance here, okay? But uh, if you, are, you can bear with me. Uh, one of the things that I would like to transmit to this honorable and distinguished group is that you have a very complex mix of people between 3.0 and 4, or 3.10. Some people have outstanding insights in that, let's call it awareness gap or awareness interval from 3.0 or 3.10. It doesn't mean that their behavior were perfectly okay or they were perfect models or exemplars of justice, the goodness and truth. And here I would like to introduce that nuance, okay? It's uh, uh, things in life, especially in that part that I call the gap from three to four, is not black or white. It's a lot of gray. Yeah, but Ruskin devoted himself to the cause of of evil. Of black, yeah, of black, absolutely. Yeah, okay. But let's not forget that when good, I said- he, he might have said nice things. I'm, I'm not doubting that could be extracted uh, and used but, for good good reasons, maybe. Sure, I'm, I'm open but, to that. But that is my speech, precisely. Okay. What right. is a, what is a hypocrite? Then? Yeah, okay. Okay, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone having enough awareness to show the beautiful face, and the beautiful face is not only your nose, your mouth, and your eyes, and your cheeks, the beautiful face is also what you are writing. Mm. And that beautiful face, you are capable of it when you are at the level three of awareness using the hexagram model, right? From, from stage three, because try to go to, a, to ask to a democratic man to write a piece on morality or on beauty, on goodness, he would not be capable of that. As to a plutocratic man to write a, a stuff from a beauty and goodness and truth, he will not be capable of that because his level of awareness is not enough. But when you reach to three, you are capable of that. But it doesn't mean that you have the true stuff in your heart and in your soul. That is why there is a lot of gray between three and four. And I would mm -hmm. like to remind everyone, even if it sounds a little bit laughable, gray is a mix of black and white. It means that the person at gray can choose to serve white or to serve black. And sometimes the moment that will bring him, the moment when he's at the crossroads, that makes him go to the black door or to the white door, something, it's a small stuff. So once again, gray is a very complex zone. And here we are in the gray zone. Mm -hmm. That's good. 
Yeah, and I, I like this idea of, of the the effective sophist as being somebody who is able to have an, a, a grasp of universals and their structure. But a, I, I would you say that accompanying that would also be an absence of self of true self knowledge to that they haven't come to know themselves. So they're trying to wield something that they're not qualified to wield in the way that it was meant to be wielded and thus but, have a sort of effect. That but absolutely absolutely because if he has true knowledge with the capital k uh using the own plato's words uh, episteme infinite awareness yeah uh, he would not be a sophist he would exactly. be an aristocratic man yeah, yeah yeah his 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 essence would be of a different nature absolutely that's good okay good <laughs> All right, let's. I, I just wanted to make that form formally explicit in the course of this this thing. So that's great. I, I knew that you thought that way, but I. All right, good. So um, let's get back onto the. Uh, Ken, reading. I see a hand. Is it by accident, or you want to say something? Yeah, no, that sh that should be lowered. Okay, okay I'll, I'll lower it. All right. In in Ku's uh, in Ku's view, the answer to the modern crisis of morality consists in the Confucian religion of good citizenship in the aesthetical appeal of the gentleman that may inspire ordinary persons in a society to fulfill the law of their being and enable them to become what Walt Whitman envisions as a law and series of laws unto himself, surrounding and providing for not only his own personal control, but all his relations to individuals and to the state. Good. Uh, a short interruption. Here, it's about the aesthetic appeal of the gentleman that may inspire ordinary persons in a society to fulfill the law of their being, enable them to become what Walt Whitman envisions as the law. So here, I just want to make the rapprochement with the Schiller's letters on aesthetic educations. That's all. Mm, good. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's perfect. We might even have a, a little link to the, uh, the aesthetical letters because that, that definitely is the essence of it. Um, in my view, Confucian religion of good citizenship synthesizes what Henry Rosemont and Roger Ames <laughs> propose as role-based contextual ethics and Kant's deontological ethics. As I will show, Ku's theses on universal truth of humanity, predicated on poetical temperament and aesthetical appeal of the gentleman, may bring new insights to current Confucian and comparative moral and political studies and on the relation between ethics and society. They promise... Uh, oh, yep. Okay, so, okay. Uh, I, I want to be a little bit of a bitch here for Professor Wang Hui Yu, okay? Uh, because I don't know personally Professor Wang Hui Yu, the guy who wrote that article, but being a professor in the U.S., he has been a little bit poisoned by the, by the Western uh, environment. And it is absolutely an ugliness that anyone who is a gentleman would see immediately in the following lines. In the, my view, Confucian religion of good citizenship synthesizes what Henry Roseman and Roger Ames propose at Rome-based contextual ethics and Kant's deontological ethics. This is ridiculous, okay? Kant's deontological ethics is an ethic based on duties. It is an absolute ugliness. It is not on duties. It is on the shining forth of your spontaneous being when you reach to the beauty, which is the level of awareness corresponding to the fourth line of the hexagram, okay? So it doesn't have to do with the ontology. It is the shining forth of your natural being. And it is not either the wrong based contextual ethics since when you talk about context when you talk about beauty and the shining forth of your natural being, okay? So I'm sorry to be a bit of a bitch, but some stuff need to be <laughs> underlined. No, that, that's good. I'm glad that you're you're here to do that. And it's, it's good to always keep in mind, we're, we are reading somebody, like you said, he's a professor, he's an academic, he's immersing himself in a peer-reviewed culture in the West using academic uh, lingo and jingo, which has all sorts of problems with it. So it's it's good to just realize that we're we're getting we're triangulating at the thing, but this is not the thing itself. This is not Ku Hong Ming, <laughs> it, but it, it's it it helps us. We're we're getting closer to it. Um, as so I you... oh yep. That's okay. Yeah. I, I was just okay. 
Uh, you, you chose a perfect land. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, they promise a new vision to move beyond moral universalism and relativism, a key problem of cross-cultural discourse against the backdrop of clash of civilizations. Um, any, does anybody else want to read? I, I don't want to hog it. You know me, Matthew, I'll happily volunteer. Sure. <laughs> Although I will apologize for all of my Chinese mistakes, one pronunciation mistake. You have but, forgiven, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll read for a little while anyway, just for fun. The legendary life of a pure Confucian. Uh, I'll start first of all, Kwan Gyu. How do I pronounce that? You've said it so many times this morning. You yeah, think yes. Uh, it's the only thing that I would be a bitch. Okay, after yeah, all, it's the philosopher that we study. That, okay? That's why I'm asking uh, right now. A G in the transliteration system called Pinyin, who has been created to be a pain in the neck for the Westerners by the Chinese <laughs> Communist Party. G <laughs> is pronounced like a K, like kangaroo. So G use is Ku. So Ku Hongming. Yes. Okay. Ku Hongming was born in Penang. Gee, I was there recently. Malaya in 1857. Nice city, by the way. I enjoyed it. His family had its roots in the town of Tongan, Fujian province, China. Uh, Ku's foster father and guardian, Mr. Brown, brought Ku to Europe for comprehensive education around 1869. Hmm. During his 11 years stay in Europe, Ku obtained an MA in Arts from the University of Edinburgh, and a diploma from the University of Leipzig. Besides, Ku traveled extensively in Europe and learned half a dozen European languages. Boy, I'm impressed with that alone. He developed also deep familiarity with works by Goethe, Shakespeare, and a number of romantic figures, including Thomas Carlyle, who mentioned uh, Ku in person, Matthew Arnold, John Milton, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Ruskin, and so on. Uh, sorry for interrupting. I just want to mention that the diploma that he got from the University of Leipzig was in engineering. So Ku was truly a polymath. Not only oh, yeah. he spoke many languages, but he was a when versed as well in arts, philosophy, literature than in sciences and technology. Yeah. Okay, and that footnote two is among others I have drawn mainly from comprehensive studies on Ku's biographical biographical information in Arkush and uh, this other fellow. Okay. Wang Jintou. Okay. Where am I? Under... See the highlighting? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ku was oh, probably... probably. The... Yeah. the first Chinese to have received comprehensive European education. In 1885, in recognition, his linguistic capacities and knowledge about Western, I think that should read his, rec his recognition of his linguistic capacities and knowledge about Western culture, Zhang Zidong, a leading Confucian scholar, official and viceroy, employed Ku as his secretary in charge of foreign documents and affairs. Under Zhang's guidance, along with influence by a range of leading Confucian scholar officials at Zhang's office, Ku progressed steadily with his study of Chinese language and Confucian classics. By the turn of the century, Ku had not only acquired respectable expertise in Confucian learning, but also established himself as a major spokesman for Chinese culture in the Western world. Sorry for interrupting. When in 1885, when Ku became the private, the secretary, the, the public secretary for Viceroy Chang Chu Tong, he was 28 years old. And he has a very peculiar characteristic of a Chinese having been born in Penang, which was a colony of the Dutch at the time, if I remember, I'm not sure. I think it was of the Dutch or of the English anyway. And uh, he received what I would call a basic Chinese culture, but not the classical Chinese culture. So when he became the secretary for Viceroy Chang Chu Tong, he learned the higher dimension of Chinese culture as a grown up man of 28 years old. Okay, so uh, and not as uh, the typical uh, Chinese having received that kind of Chinese classical education between three years old and uh, 20 years old, let's say. So, uh, and the other thing, Chang Tu Tong is very interesting in the sense that he created a concept called 
Triyong. Uh, when China has to deal with the challenge of the technological West, uh, some Chinese scholars, among whom Viceroy Chang Tutong, wanted to save the Chinese classical education, and this is what was the Viceroy Chang Tutong called Ti, meaning the roots or the essence, and Yong, meaning using, meaning that the China has to keep her classical, timeless, aristocratic education, but incorporating the science and the technology brought by the West. And it has been the continuous endeavor of the Chinese elite from around precisely 1885 to let's say 2000. I would say that from 2000, the Chinese sci science and technology became autonomous, meaning that the Chinese not only copy the science and technology from the West, but the Chinese now are capable of their own inventivity and creativity in terms of science and technology. I stop here. Continuing, and uh, in 1905, Gu was promoted to Department Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Director of the Huangpu Conservancy in Shanghai. In recognition of his scholarly achievement, the King Court awarded Q, uh, Q an honorary title of Royal Doctorate and appointed him Principal of Nanyang College in Shanghai, now Shanghai Xiaotong University in 1910. After the Chinese Revolution in 1911, Q taught at Peking University as a professor, of, a professor of English literature and Latin for a couple of years. Around 1918, an article introducing a German scholar's endorsement of Ku's advocacy for Confucian civilization triggered harsh condemnation by leading revolutionists. The disagreement between the old and new schools about Ku's ideas and other related issues escalated into the grand debate on Eastern and Western cultures which finally led to the May 4th movement in 1919. Want to read the footnote, Matthew, or not? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so this is page, page five. All right. Okay. Remarkably, Wang criticized Hu's translation harshly, noting the conceptual gap between Chinese and English words. In its republication in 1925, Wang added a postscript apologizing for the overly critical tone and admitted that public opinion had concluded long before about Ku's grand style and superior insights. Insofar as Ku's approach to translation is concerned, it is relevant to recall Lin Yu Yutang's high compliments on Ku's translation of the Zhong Yong. According to Lin, Ku Ku's rendering of key Confucian terms are essentially correct. Some are even brilliant. In my view, we should take Ku's translation as a bridge, but not direct equivalence between Eastern and Western ideas. In this sense, I agree with Lin Yutang's aff affirmation on Ku's translations. Absolutely, because translation is not words for words. Translation is that you understand the classical education from China, and you understand the classical education from the West, and you translate by the meaning and by not by the words. And sometimes you can translate the meaning by using completely different words. So quick question for you here. Um, the, the, the author is saying that there is a direct connection between this, the dispute about specifically Ku's ideas and representing, a, a, the I guess, the old interpretation of Confucian and the new schools, or, or do they mean something different that led to the May 4th movement of 1919? Uh, okay. Was it directly uh, him? Uh, no, it's directly him in the sense that Ku, uh, I, I read the stuff by Ku in Chinese. I guarantee you, is Ku is even if he came into contact with the higher Chinese education when he was a grown up man, Ku understood perfectly Chinese classical culture. Okay. It's not because you came into contact with the class Chinese classical culture between 25 and 30 that you cannot understand it. Okay. Because I know people who have been introduced within their family to the Chinese classical education from three years old to 20 years old, and they are complete imbeciles. So it's not because you have been introduced as classically introduced that you necessarily understood the true reality of that education. And it's not because you have been introduced later, like, like 
it was the case with coups that you did not understand. On the contrary, coup is a perfect example that you can reach to the classical understanding at any age if you have the mind and the soul that is needed for understanding timeless education. Well, that gives hope and purpose to today's reading, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm, 70, I'm 71, mate, so I'm starting real late with this confusion stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, Absolutely. it's all about it's all about the attempt. Anyway, uh, principle of say, hang on, where are we? Um, Kuo left Peking University shortly after the May Fourth Movement, but continued to write and lecture on modern value of Confucian teachings. In 1928, Kuo was appointed principal of Shandong University. He never assumed office, passing away in the same year. Mm. Kuo was one of the most legendary cultural figures in modern Chinese history. He was also a pioneer in comparative moral, political, and literary studies. After his death, however, his name and works faded out gradually from scholarly discourse and public attention. As Zhu Weizen asserts, while Western readers had good familiarity with Ku's work, works in late 19th and early 20th century, Ku's influence on Chinese readers had been nearly zero. Zhu Weizen, 332. In my view, it may be fair to say that due to language barrier and other factors, Ku's works, mostly written in English, did not receive the same kind of reputation in China as they did in some other parts of the world. However, it seems much an overstatement to dismiss the impact of Ku's ideas on Chinese readers altogether. For example, despite several severe interrogation by the revolutionists, Du Yakan, the editor of Dongfang Zasi, that published the controversial article about Ku in 1918, maintained that he agreed with all of Ku's ideas as cited in that article, Du Yakan 369. Du was by no means the only Chinese who had taken Ku's ideas earnestly. The German philosopher Hermann von Kesseling mentioned that when he visited Beijing in 1912, he spent many hours each day with Ku and his friends and supporters. Were more substantial evidence desirable, we could just turn to the famous scholar Wang Gaowei and his book review of Ku's translation of the Confucian text, Zong Yong. I suppose I should read that footnote, eh? Uh, all right, one sec. Just be careful when you do, Matthew. You read footnote five last time, not footnote three. No way. Did I do that? Yep. Oh, that was a weird mental uh, fart. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's say. funny because it was actually relevant, though, wasn't it? It, it kind of was in a weird way. Yeah, that the <laughs> translational thing was relevant. That's a comment on the whole article. Yeah, look anyway. at that. The, the footnote three was supposed to be something totally different. Yeah, gen uh, careful accounts of the May 4th movement. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> okay. Well, like you said, it, it kind of worked out. Yep. So footnote four is one of these friends was Mr. Shen Zhengxi widely uh, held as the greatest Confucian scholar in late Qing dynasty. Ku also facilitated an interview between Shen and Kesserling and wrote a biography of Shen after his death. Hmm. Uh, I just want to say that the famous Zhong Yong, okay, so Wang Huawei in his book review of Ku's translation of the Confucian text Zhong Yong is one of the four corners of the, of the house, okay, of the square. Okay, one of the four books, and it has been written by Zhu Su, Confucius' grandson, born in 482 BCE and died in 402 or 401 BCE. And I just want to say that the Chong Yong is the book, the classical book from which you have the endeavor of the aristocratic man, of the gentleman, meaning to put, to cultivate yourself, to put order in your family, and to uh, assist the government of the state and to bring peace to the world. So it is not a uh, small thing that to have been capable to translate the reality or the essence of that book, because once again, the aristocratic man, his capacity to fulfill the four items of the endeavors of the gentleman is directly linked to the creation of the everlasting civilization the square, meaning the foundation of the aristocratic education, ending with the top, the Chun Chu in the Kong Yang interpretation, the Tai Yi Tong, meaning the great union of the animal kingdom and the divine kingdom, meaning that 
my is serving right and not my is right. Juan, continuing. If you could only take one Confucian text on a desert island, which 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 text would you select? It's very simple. It's, but but that's a that's a personal choice. Okay, I would select the the book of songs, meaning the Shu Jing. Okay, because the three hundred and five poems are relating are related to the Chao Royal House, which is the, the creator of Chinese civilization. Because by reading those 305 poems, it would activate in the mind of any educated Chinese, the far past, the present, and the far future. Okay, So with that book, it includes the four books and the other five classics. Mm. But it's my personal taste. Okay, I prefer poetry. Someone else can choose uh, the Chun Chu, uh, the book of documents. It's ve a very personal answer. Thank you. Continuing. Right. Yes. Were more substantial evidence desirable, we could just turn to the famous scholar, Wang Gowi, and his book review of Ku's translation of the Confucian text Zong Yong. Wang, Wang admitted that Ku's translation bore out that no one in China could surpass him in comprehending the true meaning of this text. Wang's mentor, Luo Zhengyu, an authority in oracle bone script, that's interesting, and classic studies, acclaimed Ku as a pure, pure Confucian. In particular, Li, uh, Luo Luo praised highly Ku's memorial to the emperor, written in classical Chinese in 1908 and compared its superb style and political discernment to those of the great Han Confucian statesman, Jia Yi. Okay, uh, interruption here. Jia Yi was a man who lived about 35 years, but he was a great advisor of the Han dynasty. And uh, at the end of uh, the first century uh, BCE, and he, he contributed a lot to the implement the continuation of uh, the implementation of the imperial classical education because once again the classical education is not a a, a final victory okay uh, it is something that has to be fought for at each generation so and the other thing i want to say too is about uh, uh, Chun Ru, okay, did you see the two character? Okay, it's pronounced at the second tone, it Chun Ru. And when you uh, Chun, the word Chun, um, and I make a small mistake, uh, Jia Yi was not of the first century BCE, but uh, of the second century BCE. So <laughs> that's a big mistake, it's a century difference. But uh, the, the character Chun is, uh, is that character is for everything that is truly the essence of beauty, goodness, and truth, okay? And if you look at the character Chun, on the left, you have the character for wine. And for the right, you have the character for outstanding. Okay, so the Chinese is a very poetic uh, language, okay? So something, that, someone that is pure, outstanding in beauty, goodness, and truth, the four elements for Chun is the outstanding wine. So that's what we're looking at. That's what you're referring to right here. Uh, uh, if you see uh, um, uh, Yu, an authority in the Oracle Bone Script and Classic Studies, acclaimed yeah. Ku as a pure Confucian. After that, yeah. you have a parenthesis, Chun yeah. Ru. Yeah, yeah, I got it right here. Okay, yeah. the first character, Chun, yeah. on the left side, that character is for wine. Okay. Oh, okay. And the other side, that character is for outstanding. Beautiful characters. I really wish I, yeah, I have to learn this. Okay. Beautiful. Interesting symbolism. Beautiful wine. Yeah, okay. I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, Sorry, I was trying to zoom in yeah. properly here. It's giving me a hard time. Okay. There we are. Okay. Scroll up a bit. Good. However inaccurate his perception was, Zhu's discount of Ku's influence on Chinese readers was not totally unreasonable. To the best of my knowledge, none of the new Confucians in the last century, as well as any leading Confucian scholars today, have made any substantial reference to Ku's works and ideas. This is so probably because the new Chinese generations have long taken Ku as an eccentric figure with constant references to his conservative streaks, 
and especially his insistence to wear the cure and traditional Chinese clothes after the revolution. Justified or not, such prevalent public perception reflected the tension of Ku's philosophy with the trends of his time, which made him sound strange, reactionary, and impractical. Okay, hold that thought. David... Hold that thought. Uh, let's see if this this footnote six is uh, is worth uh... reading. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I tried bringing I tried Leng, bringing up the Le the bottom of the article on my page in a window so that I could simply reference those, but I can't do it while I. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Liang uh, Shuming did make a reverent note about an informal encounter with Ku when he studied at Peking University. Also, Lin Yutang spoke highly of Ku's achievements that had greatly influence that had great influence on his own personal development. Okay, bah. That was a lame footnote. Uh, where are we here? I lost it. Here it is. Okay. There it is. Okay. I'll start with that last sentence in there. R. David Akush summed up this tension nicely. He was an internationalist in an age of nationalism, a conservative in an age of change, an elitist in an age of egalitarianism, a moralist in an age of positism, a generalist in an age of specialization, a lover of delicacy and refinement in an age of utilitarianism. He was in between East and West at a time when there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. That's a fun paragraph to read. Such may be the main reasons for the prevalent negative caricature of Ku as an embodied anachronism or an old fogey. For those people in China and West who were preoccupied with economic and political progress, Q's views and behaviours, which bore out his despise of modern obsession with materialism, his allegiance to a disintegrating monarchy, and his faith in the universal and eternal value of Confucian civilization, all sounded very strange. Nevertheless, the only real strangeness in the matter might be that it should so sound, if only we could understand the real vision of Q's philosophy an ideal type of humanity who was able to combine a true sense for the moral worth and beauty of the old Chinese civilization with an aptitude for interpreting and understanding the expansive progressive ideas of the modern European civilization. As Akush pointed out, Ku saw himself like Confucius as the gentleman who is not used. For Ku, the times were out of joint. However, while most modern Chinese have taken Ku to be behind his time, I believe Kuo's visions and ideas, which were inspired by both classical Confucian teachings and the aesthetic ideals of modern romantic thinkers, were really ahead of his time. They may even be timeless. Not only are Kuo's interpretation of Confucianism still relevant to current Confucian and comparative studies, but many of Kuo's theses and arguments with timely modifications and expansion would prove valuable and constructive for a range of exigent social and political problems today. Small interruption. I was being a bitch for Professor Wang Huai Yu 15 minutes ago, but I would say that probably he added the, the, the ontological ethics by Khan and so on to just to placate his Western colleagues. Mm -hmm. And here he's courageous enough to write, they may even be timeless, okay? Mm -hmm. Because after all, what is a classical or aristocratic education? It is an education that is timeless, precise. Right. Yes. So he he was, uh, let's say, careful not to offend anyone. So he wrote, they may even be timeless rather than they are timeless. All right. So he's demonstrating some street smarts. Okay. All right. One a point for the professor. <laughs> Nuance is everywhere. One of Gu's greatest, sorry, one of Ku's greatest insights consists in his critical understanding of and cultivated response to the then prevailing prevalent racist, colonial, and imperialistic ideologies as he envisaged a way beyond the scylla of a false universalism and the charybdis of parochial nationalism, relativism. In Ku's view, the real cause of revolution was the intense feeling of humiliation and resentment against the racist attitudes of the foreigners who think we are only Chinese and look down upon us. The Chinese revolution was not really a revolt against a corrupt but tyrannical government. It was a revolution against the weakness of the government for allowing the foreigners to treat us like that. 
In other words, the real cause of the revolution was a false universalism, which takes every European standard as universal, combined with fanatic nationalism. Just as the boxer outbreak in 1900 was a fanatical explosion of hurt national pride, so the present revolution is a fanatical outburst of national vanity. Uh, interruption. Uh, I think here that Ku has been outstanding by analyzing perfectly the psychology of the Chinese at the time. Meaning that when Ku, and I, I think he was right, okay, when it is, he wrote that it was a revolution against the weakness of the Chinese government for allowing the foreigners to treat us like that. In other words, the real cause of the revolution was a false universalism combined with fanatic nationalism. After said otherwise, it was a wounded pride and vanity from the Chinese people. And I say that from the animal kingdom perspective, they were right to be offended, of course. But what is interesting here is that you don't restore a civilization by being wounded or offended. You restore a civilization if you have the mind powers of justice, valor, humanity, and wisdom to create or to recreate the tools of power that would make you restore that civilization, okay? That is the difference from understanding between the democratic man motivated precisely by hedonism, Lex Talionis, the desire for revenge against those who offended them, and uh, their understanding limited to sense perception, and the plutocratic man motivated by power and profit, versus the democratic man and the aristocratic man, meaning man having the powers of the mind called justice, valor, and moderation and wisdom, which will make them capable to create the tools of power to restore the fallen civilization. And that is very important because you don't restore anything, especially, especially in not something as complex as a civilization by being offended or by being humiliated. Of course, that those are the primary emotions that can spur us to act, but it is not by those lowly and inferior emotions that you won't have the mind powers of justice, valor, humanity, and wisdom to do what is needed. So that paragraph is extremely important. Mm. Matthew, you said before that uh, it's a hard stop at 10 o'clock. We're going to go to the uh, the end of this section, which is like right here. And then okay. we can chat for a little bit. Not yeah, a hard stop, yeah. but stop. Yeah. But I saw yeah, sure. Ken also has a and thought. I, uh, Ken, yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm keenly interested in modern China. I try to study as much as I can. I, I want to say that I uh, really uh, concur with what um, Quan has just said. I think you see this whole thing that uh, Ku had so incisive, insightfully uh, noticed, uh, reflected, re it resonates today in Chinese uh, propaganda, you know, this whole century of humiliation idea, it keeps repeating itself over and over and over and over again. They just can't shake it, you know, but it just seems to be the compelling motive behind so much of what comes out of China in terms of the verbiage and the, you know, um, statements about China's development and so forth. It, it's really a very important idea. Uh, I would like to say something about that, Ken, uh, if it's yeah. okay. Uh, let's not forget that China is ruled by democratic and aristocratic man. The propaganda concerning of the century of humiliation is not for the democratic man and the aristocratic man. It is the propaganda made by the aristocratic man for the Chinese democratic right. man, okay? Right. So from the perspective of the government, okay? And I would like to remind you that government comes from the two Latin word, gubernare mantis, to be at the hem of the mind. So- To be what? Repeat To be at the hem, to be at the hem, H-E-L-M, to be the hemsman of the mind. Yes, yeah. part of the bike, Okay, yeah. gubernare mantis. 
And the Hems man are the Chinese aristocratic and democratic man. Those men are capable not to be governed by their inferior emotions. Those men are the men who gave the framework and who ruined China. But the propaganda about the century of humiliation made by them, of course, is not for them. It's for the Chinese democratic man. But at the same time, at the same time, there is a double stream of propaganda. There is the first, the stream reminding to the demonstry of humiliation, but there is also a more positive propagandistic stream reminding them to work for their family and for the nations. So it is to the aristocratic man to decide the kind of propaganda or education or instruction you can decide of the words that you like, destined for the democratic man, either Chinese or anything, or Canadian, or American, or Brazilian, or, Fran or French, etc. Because once again, I want to come back to this image. King, King can reflect the many lay the six layers of your mind within a person, of course. But King also reflects the different layers of population within a country. And as with all nations, there are less aristocratic men in China than they are democratic men in China. Absolutely. So, but, yeah, but let me ask you this, Quan. Um, to what extent do you see the current regime, and you know, the Communist Party and so forth, as being receptive to what we're talking about today as classical Chinese civilization? To what extent do they reject it, would you say? They accept that at 100% because you don't have to believe me. But Mao Zedong, the creator of New China, is a son of heaven, meaning a philosopher king. And he has been pushed forward to power by the landlords having received a classical Chinese education. The man who gave him the Chinese classical education and also his father-in-law, Professor Yang Chang Chi Yang was his family name, Y A N G. His given name is Chang Chi, C H A N G J I. He was born in 1870 and he died in 1920. And he gave his, his daughter Yang Kai Hui to Mao Zedong. So he, this man gave the Chinese classical education to Mao Zedong when he was 16 years old and he brought Mao Zedong to Beijing University at 19 years old. So be very sure, and you know, I know that you don't have that kind of information in the West. Mao Zedong was the product of the landlord class of China, having received the classical education. So for a Westerner, it's very difficult to see Mao Zedong as a product of the landlord class, having received a classical Chinese education. Well, given given the supposed uh, anti-religious uh, bias that Communist Party is supposed to have, I was very shocked when on Nixon's visit to China, Mao Zedong gave him a copy of the dialects, okay? The dialects, you mean the analects? I'm sorry, the analects, yeah, the analects. Absolutely, okay? So I know that what I just said might be a shock for many Westerners, Mao Zedong is a son of heaven. He's the product of the Chinese landlord class, having received a classical Chinese education. And Mao Zedong received a Chinese classical education through his teacher and his father-in-law, Yang Chang Chi. Yeah. No, I, I think it's very important that you said that. And I think maybe in, we should have a class at some point on this in, in more explicit detail, because there's a lot of misinformation that's been circulating, uh, obviously, about Mao for a long time. Um, you know, we've all heard the same, so like, you know, the, the, these these associations by Corbett and others that simply lazily clatch on to like a sort of a Princeton, uh, a, a Beijing based Princeton newspaper that that he found himself editing in and working at a bookstore that's affiliated with this you know, this, this, this Princeton outfit. And then all of a sudden you've got these grand conclusions that thus he is a skull and bones 
puppet and all of these things that completely ignore everything you just said regarding the continuity of the this of the Confucian ideas, the classics, the 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 relationship that he had to his father in law, the relationship that he had to Sun Yat Sen as well, uh, which was a very important one. All of these things are just completely ignored to in order to get a very satisfying, lazy, sloppy, simple answer to something that is so much more complex. Um, so I, again, I, I do think it would be nice at some point soon to maybe host a, a lecture going. Or maybe, or maybe, or maybe that narrative is narrative that fits the Western propaganda goals. My, my way, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Monty, there, I see you. I see you with your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate this discourse and. Uh, uh, I would like to address an issue which is close to my heart, which you addressed at the very beginning uh, uh, insofar as the mandate of heaven. And uh, I, I would like to fast forward uh, to today. Uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, put a substack post uh, on a LaRouche speech from 1999 called The Storm Over Asia. And uh, I view it uh, as more or less a, a Confucian kind of address he gave. And so far as related to the mandate of heaven, he talked specifically in 1999, 25 years ago, uh, about the requirement at the essence, uh, which is in our Declaration of Independence, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which was an, a Leibnizian ideal as opposed to the life, liberty, and property of uh, the colonialist, imperialist master who wish to have a domination in the world. And in light of that, he, he further talked about, specifically in this address, uh, of the idea of man made in the image of God, which relates to the, man, the mandate of heaven and the requirement by sovereign nation states and the need for sovereign nation states uh, uh, to abide by that. In other words, that's the means by which we can have a dialogue for a community of principle amongst nations uh, for development and the protection of the sovereign nation states. Now, this is also the 25th anniversary of 1999, in which uh, NATO and the collective West uh, had a 78-day bombing campaign against Yugoslavia, which was in essence of basically a declaration of war by the collective West in these imperial entity against sovereign nation states. It's also the 25th anniversary of Putin becoming the prime minister of Russia. Uh, and I mention this because it's very obvious to me that Russia and China adopted this idea which I'm sure they were listening to LaRouche's speech, they followed very closely about this need for sovereign nation states, about the mandate of heaven, about man made in the image of God. And I think Russia realizes that we're in an existent, they are in an existential crisis now, insofar as the determination by this entity to balkanize the world and destroy that concept. And so they see this as an existential crisis. And I guess my question to you is, does China also see it in this sense where they realize that there is a requirement, in essence, not only for uh, politics by other means, in other words, war, and so far as protecting this idea of a sovereign nation state of peoples and the mandate of heaven? Well, I know that Matt has to go soon, so I wouldn't give you an answer because I like very much your question, but your, your question is a vital and essential question. China, for me, is a sovereign civilizational state, and there are now three sovereign, sovereign civilizational states that are China, Russia, and Iran having the desire, and more importantly, because in life it's not only the desire that define you, but the powers to bring down what I call the KFC Azrael, meaning the Takistocratic feudal conglomerate of the anglo zio American establishment. And I am perfectly aware that we are at a crossroad of universal history. 
And that's why I'm absolutely delighted to participate to those discussion because I believe very much in those three sovereign civilizational states that will play their role in universal history because they have the desire to protect their civilization, but also to protect all mankind against the cacistocratic feudal conglomerate of the anglo zio american establishment. I stop well, my uh, speech here, and I will have probably occasions in the future to keep on that speech. You most bravo, certainly bravo. will. Can I, can, I, can I just butt in here? No, no, no. One uh, second, one second. For the sake of completion, we, we have to finish the last two paragraphs of this yeah, section, okay. or else I won't sure. sleep at yeah. night. I won't yeah, okay. sleep okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, happily do that. <laughs> Okay, remarkably, precisely because the revolution stemmed from a world of pathos, pathos entangled with a false universalism and fanatic nationalism, it was doomed to fail. In Coors' view, the racial prejudice of the Europeans could and would not be changed just because the Chinese decided to imitate the Europeans by cutting off their queues and putting on European clothes. Instead, the only way to win true respect was to show what we Chinese really are a people with a somewhat different but as wonderful a civilization as theirs and not a whit inferior. Hence the one reform, which China needs above all others is not queue cutting or constitution making, but to send our good people, the best of the Chinese, to show the people of Europe and America what we are. In short, it is by joining the best with best that we can ever hope to break down the dividing line of East and West. Hear, hear. That's a yes, nice way to round this out. Good. That's where hey, we're going to finish it. What's a Q? What's a Q? What's a Q? Uh, it's the hairstyle of the last dynasty. Yeah, the, the, the pigtails are at the back. Yeah. The long pigtail in the back, or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just go on Wikipedia. You write the hairstyle of the Qing dynasty, Q I N G, okay. and you will have images of that. Yeah, thank you. Now, now, Quan, I, I, I'm going to take us back a little bit in time, and uh, I'm not going to suggest, for example, that we've been through this before. But I have a book here. Somebody knocked it off from the University of Melbourne. It wasn't me, but it ended up in my possession. Confucius, the Man and the Myth by H.G. Creel. Yeah. Okay, now I don't know whether you know anything about it, but I have recently read that book. And one of the things that makes it relevant to today's discussion, in it, he talks about the way in which through the uh, uh, Silk Road and everything like that, you know, Marco Polo, whatever, Chinese ideas began to appear in Europe. Uh, a lot of them bought by Jesuits who were, you know, traveling to China at the time too, and Jesuits being the secret service of the Vatican, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can already, you know, start thinking conspiracy theories if you want to. You don't have to, though. The, the writing of, uh, of Mr. Creel, though, suggests that during that time of um, radical change, if you like, in terms of thinking, philosophical, political thinking, particularly in Europe, um, much of which came to the fore post the American Revolution. Matthew, you've spoken and written about this many, many times, that there was a lot of admiration by various Western thinkers. Um, the only name that comes to mind, but there are plenty of others, Voltaire. Like um, yeah, look, look, plenty of them that were saying that in their opinion, the Chinese system of government was the best and most perfect in the world at the time. I would like to interrupt you by saying that uh, the French uh, civil service system, uh, examination and the English civil service exams were imitated from the Chinese imperial exams and there are no higher complement than imitation. Yeah, sure. So uh, my question therefore is with such a profound influence as early as the 1600s and continuing through from there, um, we then went from, from such respect, and as you're, the, the example you just gave, that's profound respect, to the period of humiliation, you know, the drug wars, basically. Um, uh, had that not happened, how far do you think the influence of Chinese thinking at that time, let, let's put a timeline on it too, let's say 1800. How far do you think Chinese thinking might have gone in terms of an overall influence on Western thinking and perhaps even change the, the, uh, the course of history? Uh, my, my quick answer is that the Chinese thinking would not have changed the Western thinking, but the Chinese influence, the classical Chinese influence would have helped the Westerner 
to keep their own Western classical tradition. Okay, because yeah. the West lost its classical tradition, let's say since 1900, okay, roughly, okay. So if China did not undergo uh, the century of humiliation between 1839 to 1949, China would have been a perfect dialogue partner with the West and would have helped the West to keep its own classical education rather than to go downward with the stupidities of the postmodernisms and etc. Yeah, which seemed to be exactly what Mr. Creel was saying in his book, that the potential for Chinese influence was absolutely huge and it's a pity that it didn't continue. Well, my, my ambition that is the restoration of the Chinese power and of the yeah. Chinese classical literature would help, uh, it maybe it's a little, pre, a little bit pretentious to say that, the West to recover its own classical education and its own classical education. Because the West uh, achieved glory in terms of civilization and in terms of empire. So when a group of people achieve glory in terms of civilization and in terms of empire, those people would never copy the stuff of another people, even if that people achieve glory and imperial uh, power. But mm. what can happen is that China can help the West to recover its own classical tradition and its own classical behavior. That's my opinion. Which seems to be obvious, you know, I mean, in the last few months, we have been doing a, a lot of platonic reading and your understanding of the platonic system and now explanations of the Confucian system. You know, one has five levels, one has six levels. But to me, listening to it, it's like we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, for, forgive me, Paul, the Chinese and the Greek system both have six lines. Oh, so, <laughs> sorry, six levels, six levels. That's right. There's the one above the five. Um, it, it, this, this is, as, you know... It goes to what you just said a minute ago that the the West has lost its sense I'm... of its own of its own um, heritage. Um, one of the other um, researchers that I follow great. Unfortunately, is uh, uh, Paul. Paul uh, I'm so sorry, gotta Paul. Go. Yeah, 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 yeah we've got to wrap it. Yeah. But it, but it's a good point. I mean, the, we've lost a sense of our own heritage, and and sometimes, as, as I think, uh, 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 Ku had had made the point very nicely. That it's it's only by finding the best of what we are that we can see the best of what somebody else is, and then have a communion of of spirits based on on something respectable as the foundation of trust and and actual yeah, sure. international law in a healthy yeah. way, which would bring us back into a mandate of heaven, rather than go down the into a new dark age, which is currently what we're toying with in the West. So yeah, sure. Can I can I just end with a little bit of uh, um, I don't want to call it hope, but the potential or, for change along those lines. And for it to happen very, very quickly, with, we've seen that in the last 20 years in both Russia and China in particular. So that, you know, for the people in the community that believe that things are hopeless and everything like that, change can happen very, very fast. And I would suggest that uh, what you just said, you know, and what uh, um, we're reading, the idea of bringing the best of, you know, both systems, West and East and whatever, together and finding a synthesis is really what we're looking to do. And thus the twain shall meet. Okay, yeah. guys. So yeah, this is a fun one. Until Enjoy. next week. Yeah. Bye. All. I hope oh. to be able to make it. I, I might have trouble getting Wi-Fi where okay. I am in this. No I'll be in Bali next time anyway. Don't worry. The world will right. keep spinning. All right. Take care. Uh, Thank you so it. much. Ciao. Bye.